Javon Boyd was fatally shot early Saturday in the Armour Square community, just blocks south of U.S. Cellular Field. Family members said the 28-year-old was working part-time as a livery driver when he was shot waiting to pick up a customer. Rondo number no. 9 was a young musical prodigy coming out of the south side of Chicago. Rondo is actually from the 600 set of the BDs or Black Disciples. The Chicago street gang famous for beefing with the GDs or Gangster Disciples and their respective sets including the Flyboy Gang or FBG who you might recognize from that acronym FBG Duck. But this story ain't about Duck, it's about Rondo. And what made Rondo special wasn't the work he was putting in on the streets, but the work he was putting in in the booth rising to musical prominence at such a young age. Born in 97, Rondo was only 16 when his musical career began taking off. He dropped the mixtape I'm Up Next in 2012, followed by Real Nigel for Life in 2013, a tape which of course featured the YouTube street hit Taliban, which is today sitting at a whopping 8.5 million views. He'd also collaborated on that same project with his boy C-Day on tracks like Get Some Guap. And that same year, he even appeared on his most prominent song Play For Keeps with L.A. Capone, a track that is today sitting at a ginormous 41 million views. A track that also coincidentally comes from the OTF mixtape Steve Drive. And of course, speaking of OTF, Rondo also appeared on the track Ride alongside OTF General Lil Durk in 2013. And elsewhere, Rondo has video after video with huge view counts that demonstrate even from the very start he was truly a big music industry prospect. His Hang With Me remix has 19 million views. Life of a Savage has five and a half. Him and his boy C-Day appeared on the track Bailout, which now holds over seven and a half million views. So all of this shows that Rondo, despite coming from a challenging background and part of the world where there are a few ways out, he seemed to be lucky enough to have unlocked a route out of the violent streets of Chicago through his musical talent. After all, this is the same era as Chief Keith's track, I Don't Like was blowing up in the mainstream music industry and taking Chief Keef out of the streets for good, giving him the financial stability and industry connections to change his life for the better. So with everything seemingly going in the right direction, Rondo dropped his long-awaited sequel mixtape Real Nigel for Life Part 2 on the 19th of February 2014. And at this point, it looked like he had a bright future ahead of him. However, only two days after this mixtape's release, Rondo's future would suddenly be not so bright, as he would find out that maybe after all, he had been keeping it a little too real. On February the 21st, 2014, Rondo and his buddy C-Day were at a party at the Wentworth Gardens housing projects in Chicago, a block essentially controlled by Rondo's ops. Rondo and C-Day are there with a few girls that they know, as well as fellow Chirac drillers Tay 600 and D Rose. Eventually, the boys left the party, leaving the girls behind. But after the boys left, the girls ended up getting in some kind of argument at this house party where shots were fired. Nobody was injured in this incident, but everybody scattered. And after that, the girls left the party, calling the boys, arranging for them all to meet up at a nearby Wendy's. Now it's unclear exactly what their strategy was at this point, but let's assume that this crew of BDs decided to head back into that GD territory that they had just left to try and retaliate for the girls in their entourage being shot at. So at the Wendy's, Rondo, D Rose and C Day all got into one car and they drove leading a convoy followed by two other cars filled with people that they'd been hanging out with that night, including Tay 600. When they reached 38th Street and Princeton in the Wentworth Gardens area, they passed a stationary car being driven by 28-year-old Javon Boyd. Javon Boyd was a cab driver who was parked up in the area where that earlier party had taken place. So he was there for completely unrelated reasons for that party that had taken place that night. He just happened to be waiting for a fare to arrive from the block. However, after passing this car, Rondo's convoy did a U-turn and pulled up to the vehicle. At this point, Rondo and C-Day got out and approached Boyd's car, apparently approaching him on foot and asking if he was from the area. When he said yes, one of the two men opened fire hitting Boyd seven times and ending his life. The two men then immediately ran back to their convoy and fled the scene. A couple weeks later in March, Rondo and C-Day were picked up by the cops, charged with murder and held on $2 million bail. The Chicago drill community was mortified with the likes of Chief Keith calling for their freedom. However, Keith would be duly disappointed because even at this early stage in the case, there was a mountain of evidence in the cops' possession, mainly due to this apparently being a very sloppy job by Rondo and C-Day. C-Day was implicated by his own fingerprints that were left on the victim's car. The entire attack was captured on a surveillance camera. The video was even 
even played in the trial, which caused the victim's family to burst into tears and have to leave the courtroom. In fact, Cide and Rondo even tried to call for a mistrial over this, but were quickly shut down by the judge. But things weren't much better for Rondo, who was apparently easily identified by witnesses because of the distinctive Burberry tiger print outfit that he was wearing that night. But here's the real doozy. Cide dropped his mobile phone at the scene of the crime. Yes, his actual mobile phone at the scene where the crime happened. And he didn't realize until he had already fled the scene what he had done. I mean, imagine how that must feel. You're on the way home from a successful drilling and you ask one of your fellow shooters, hey, can somebody call my phone? But hey, if that wasn't bad enough, C-Day even convinced one of the girls that he was with that night to go back to the crime scene and tell the cops that she had dropped her phone in the area earlier that day to try and get them to give it to her. Well, as you might expect, this was a complete disaster. Combine that with the fact that two of the girls that were in the convoy that night filed witness statements implicating Rondo and C-Day with them even taking the stand in court to say what happened. We're talking the same girl who C-Day tried to convince to go back to the crime scene to recover the lost mobile phone, who apparently told investigators that she had witnessed C-Day and Rondo speaking to the victim and then named C-Day as the shooter. Though stopping short of fully snitching, saying at trial that she'd never actually seen a gun. Now, I know there's been a lot of internet hate on this girl for snitching, but I would say chances are she was probably facing hefty accessory charges for going back to the crime scene and trying to get that phone. So hardly a surprising flip by the feds. And apparently she had been ducking, appearing at this trial for months as apparently investigators had made 15 unsuccessful attempts to locate and serve her. In response to that, in the closing arguments, Rondo's lawyer tried to discredit the state's witnesses, saying they were just telling the police nonsense about who the shooters were to avoid being charged themselves. And ironically, before things had actually gone to trial, C-Day had initially made a motion to be tried separately from Rondo, which didn't seem to be supported by Rondo's legal team and was eventually denied. This is something that Rondo would later come to regret and attempt to remedy with a court appeal. This led C Day and Rondo to face a joint murder trial with all of that evidence against both of them, and unsurprisingly, the jury duly found Rondo and C Day guilty of murder in the first degree. And in addition to that, there was also a bonus charge for the use of a firearm in the commission of this offence, which the prosecution had initially pushed to use so they could add another 15 years on top of the original sentence, a firearm charge which, for the record, only Rondo was convicted of, not C Day. Not necessarily proven that he was the shooter, but proven that he did have a firearm. But in the end, this extra firearm conviction would only make a difference of one year, ultimately leading to a 39 year sentence for Rondo and 38 years for C-Day. And I tell you what, I doubt having one year less was much comfort to him. Hi, my name is Eugene Horton, a paralegal investigator for the past 30 years. I inquire into, expose, and challenge wrongful convictions. Clint Massey, is a person who I'm definitely defending right now because I know I got evidence that he's wrongfully convicted. Since this devastating verdict was delivered, a lot has been said by both sides. Both Rondo and C Day have tried to appeal the judgment with limited success, and looking at actual documents for the appeal, C Day is claiming that the evidence wasn't sufficient enough to convict him on a first degree murder charge, mainly on the basis that he feels that the intent to commit first degree murder was never proven. Meanwhile, over on Rondo's appeal, he actually pointed to his legal counsel, saying that they were ineffective for not pursuing a possible defense that C-Day was the sole shooter. Now, Rondo has since been called a snitch for even suggesting that C-Day might have been the sole shooter in court documents. Hey, I guess that's why 6 9 always looked up to Rondo, right? The person who made me start rapping was Rondo number nine. Nah. I swear to God. <laughs> really though, a lot of people have said that by claiming this defense, Rondo is essentially snitching on his co-defendant C-Day. However, in a way, this statement is kind of just supporting the existing ballistics evidence already revealed in a case that suggested all bullets had been fired from a single gun. And in his appeal, Rondo is vigorously admonishing his own legal team for not more vigorously pursuing the possible defense that C-Day was that sole shooter. I mean, he's not directly snitching saying that C-Day did it, but he is kind of snitching via his legal team saying that, hey, why didn't they look into the other guy? I mean, is Rondo wrong for trying to use this existing shred of information to get himself out of a bad or unjust situation? Is this some kind of secondhand snitching? What do I know? I'm not the snitch police. But to be fair to Rondo, there's a paragraph in his appeal that lays out all of the evidence that the court had against C-Day, which were all things apparently C-Day himself had either slipped up on or spilled the beans on himself. For example, witnesses recognized C-Day's voice from that original phone call with the girls informing the boys about the shooting that had taken place at that house party. Witnesses said that C-Day himself was the one who had asked the victim if he was from over here and then apparently bragged it was a man down referring to the victim. C-Day of course left his own fingerprints on the victim's car and of course C-Day left his own mobile phone at the crime scene and 
tried to get someone to go back and get it. But none of this even matters because the court weren't buying it either way. C Day's appeals were slapped down, saying that there was enough evidence to convict C Day of murder, whether he was a principal or an accomplice. And even though it couldn't be proven exactly who was the shooter, of course, one witness did describe Rondo as the shooter, which essentially invalidates either defendant's attempts to point the finger at the other. Because the fact is, overwhelming amounts of evidence put both of them and only them at the scene of the killing, a fact which is just undeniable. Then, of course, combine that with the CCTV surveillance video that shows both men committing the attack, but it is not clear who is the one doing the shooting. Essentially, Rondo's defense that his legal team were at fault for not pursuing the one shooter theory was slapped down by the court on this basis, who said attempting this would undermine his own legal strategy. Because regardless of who did the shooting, all of the witnesses still put Rondo at the scene of the murder. At the end of the day, having a lawyer who pursues an unsuccessful strategy doesn't necessarily mean that lawyer or that strategy was bad. And since so much of this one shooter theory is still reliant on the witness statement that C Day was the shooter, by conceding to that witness's credibility, Rondo is also conceding to their statement that he was there right next to the shooter when the incident took place. Basically just as good as an accomplice. But that's not all the snitching allegations that came after the fact. Rondo's co-defendant C Day and fellow BD comrades E Day and 600 Breezy have previously labeled Tay 600, one of the guys that was there in that convoy that night, as a snitch on numerous occasions. These sentiments have been echoed by both Lil Durk and Lil Reese, and 600 Breezy even told Vlad TV that a lawyer had showed him paperwork that said that Tay 600 snitched. Rondo also reposted on Twitter that Tay snitched, along with a link to some redacted court documents, which for the record don't confirm anyone by name, but do confirm that a male with affiliations to 600 Block did speak to the cops at some point. Tay denied this, saying that there were no male witnesses used in this case in an interview with DJ Vlad. No males got on the stand and testified against, against Rondo. And saying specifically that a fake statement had been passed around in order to try and put dirt on his name. It was a fake statement floating around and it said in the statement, I, Jamonte D. Carpenter, to have seen Ron doing C. They shoot the person five times, you know. And the statement was so fake because if you read the statement, for one, court document is not going to say Ron doing C. They is going to say Courtney and Clint. And apparently even E. Day had admitted that fake paperwork had been circulating, but going on to suggest that he had seen some other paperwork, which was probably this piece that seems to suggest if it is authentic, though that has been doubted, that Tay was tracked down by the cops and initially denied even being there that night. But then when the cops showed him that he was pinned there by three witnesses, he apparently told the cops that he was in the convoy that night and supposedly had witnessed Rondo doing the shooting. But let's make this clear. Who knows if that's real? Fake paperwork has been circulating. Tay himself says it is not real and he has made it very clear that he never testified in this trial and no evidence has been produced to suggest he did. I was never in a courtroom with Rondo or Cide ever. I never seen a courtroom with them. Anyway, none of this even matters because Rondo's motion for appeal was duly denied. The court said his legal counsel did exactly what they were supposed to do. Apparently the testimony against him was not prejudiced and it was overwhelmingly clear from the evidence that he was definitely present at the crime scene. And then finally, the last thread he was clinging onto, the court decided that the outburst by the victim's family when they were shown the video of the crime was not worthy of a mistrial. Look, I'll be honest with you, and I know a lot of internet tough guys or Chicago gangsters are not gonna like what I'm about to say, but this is probably the right decision. And I know that Rondo is still running around online trying to get Kim K to free him. I really doubt that's gonna work. And honestly, Honestly, to the people that are still screaming free Rondo number nine, even in the face of the mountains of evidence against him, you are frankly doing a genuine disservice to all of the incarcerated young men who have genuinely been prisoned unfairly and do deserve help. He deserved a fair trial, which he got, and at no point during his trial or his sentencing has Rondo seemed to have shown any remorse for his involvement in the tragic slaying of a completely innocent man. Sure, Rondo was about that life, which we knew from his music, and hell, his music career was even taken off in a big way. Only days before this senseless killing had he released his latest mixtape, and he finally had a chance that so many people from his challenging background would have only dreamed of. An opportunity to get out of the streets and go straight off of music. But only two days after releasing this project, in cold blood, he took the life of a completely innocent young man who was working hard at an honest job driving a cab. And Rondo really did this for no good reason. Just because him and his boys wanted some get back because someone had let off some shots at a completely unrelated party that same night. Rondo's victim was named Javon Boyd. And while the likes of Chief Keith were screaming free Rondo on Twitter, Javon Boyd's aunt was being interviewed about her nephew on the news. His aunt was his main guardian because his mum, 
and three of his siblings had tragically lost their lives in a 1994 fire at Robert Taylor Homes. Boyd had overcome this adversity, grown up, and was trying to make an honest living working two jobs. Spending his days working for the Green Corps chopping trees, and at night he was driving cabs. Putting in all of that work so he could earn money to support his fiance and his 11 year old daughter. Now that fiance is missing a husband, and that daughter is growing up without a father. Court papers made it very clear that Boyd had nothing to do with the gang altercation that had happened earlier that night. He was literally just going about his business, doing an honest night's work, and just found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. So whether or not you agree that Rondo or C-Day deserved the sentence, one thing is for sure, Javon Boyd definitely did not deserve the death sentence that he was handed that night by Rondo and C-Day. 